mean, I think that um, you have four fantastic presentations, and each in their own way uh, tell us something very important, uh, which is that the, not simply that we're in a crisis, but the assumptions of the universality of European ideas uh, is over. And the universities are having great difficulty dealing with this, not just in Europe, but all the universities influenced by Europe are having great difficulty re reformulating how to think outside of the box of the assumptions of universality coming from Europe and the United States, because the United States is so linked to Europe, as I think Carlos quite rightly uh, pointed out. And um, this is not to, uh, I am not siding with the populace, uh, I'm not rejecting, you know, anything in particular, not rejecting the Enlightenment, but it's clear that it doesn't work. And it's clear that not only does it not work, but it doesn't work in the, in the sense that, again, as Carlos said, it, it, you know, the, the European model has dominated the world for three centuries. Peanuts. Peanuts. And the Chinese waited around and the, the Indians waited around with contempt frankly, and uh, without engaging in the ethical issues, certainly the Chinese, uh, see themselves as taking over in some way that suits them, which is not at all the European way that involves international armies and so on, with great ease because we're committing suicide. The suicide of the West over the last 50 years has been astonishing. Uh, the engagement in what's called globalization, which is an early to mid 19th century Midlands English idea, right? Which was pulled out of a drawer by some third rate economists and turned into a brand new economic theory that was gonna change the world. And I spent a lot of time in China and India and people just laughed and thought this is really, if they wanna commit suicide, let them commit suicide with their silliness. And we have committed suicide. And so we've had this very interesting conversation over two days. Um, starting with the threat to egalitarianism, not equality. This is part of the conversation yesterday, egalitarianism, the possibility of egalitarianism, uh, and as a result, what I would call the return of class, very old-fashioned, 18th, 19th century ideas of class. And I would add to that, it's very interesting because there was a little, little tug of war at the end of the last session about uh, Mark Zuckerberg, where, uh, I, and I agree, of course, with what uh, Haroon said about it, where suddenly, we're treating rich men's foibles and indulgences exactly the way we treated rich men's foibles and indulgences in the 18th and the 19th century. I'm rich. I'm the Duke of Shaftesbury. I'm the Duke of whatever. And this is what I want to do. This is how I am going to save the world with my money. And I'm certainly not going to pay taxes so that any kind of shared wealth can solve the problems. The very idea that we would think that we want to solve medical or political or social problems according to what somebody who invented a computer thinks is the way the world should be organized shows the degeneracy of our own society, that we would even want to do that as opposed to simply taxing the hell out of them and doing it on the basis of the public good. So, and I'm, and I'm going to stop because I know I'm supposed to be fast. And all I want to say uh, on top of that is then, and we talked about labor, this enormous crisis where we're moving blindly, and I, th I thought it came out brilliantly in that conversation, how blindly we're moving. Everybody was, I thought, really very clever about that. And then this conversation about truth and lies. Again, enormous confusion. I think what comes out of this conversation, we should be very proud of the confusion which it reveals, because it shows what, on uh, the one hand, what is not working. And then my last comment would be this, and, and, I, and, 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 and I think that uh, Jose, uh, um, was uh, thank him very much for his comments and actually all four of you. Uh, there are many other ideas out there, universal ideas. There are many other ideas of cosmopolitanism. To be frank with you, I don't read Western philosophy anymore. I read basically indigenous philosophy because it, I don't want to look at the roots. I've read enough of the roots coming out of Europe. I'm finding fascinating stuff coming out of, uh, uh, out of particularly the northern half of North America, which I come from, where I, brilliant philosophers are actually with effortlessly writing about 
a different kind of relationship of human beings to place. Rejecting Plato, in fact, in favor of something that's closer to maybe uh, uh, Vico, uh, to, to take an example, or Erasmus, and, and really say, no, 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 you can look at human beings in a completely different way in terms of their relationship, because it's in fact the Western approach which has created the crisis by putting human beings on this top of this pyramid. And um, we have to get off the top of the pyramid in order to examine the way we're handling things. And a lot of very, very brilliant writing is being done about this, but it is not coming through the prism of Western intellectual traditions. And that's something I don't think that we in Europe or in the United States, uh, and I think certainly half Canada is very divided on the issue, I don't think we're dealing with that adequately. Rafael, you need no introduction, so please go ahead. Thank you, Sam. Me Uh, voy a hacer uso de una de las, repito, mientras John está poniendo sus auriculares y considerando el tema de la sesión, voy a hacer uso de una de las características de los cyborgs, que es hacer uso de sus aparatos, digamos, también exteriores de sus cuerpos. Es decir, yo hablo por, esto, por este micrófono en español, y John me va a comprender perfectamente a partir de un otro aparato y así nos vamos a comunicar. De esta forma consigo ejemplificar dos cosas. Primero, digamos que es mi compromiso ético con aquello que Marcelo Ebrard me comentó uh, ayer, que es la posibilidad de utilizar el idioma local, o lo que sea, no estamos esclavos solamente de un idioma que es el inglés. Y yo creo que eso tiene mucho que ver con el debate del cosmopolitanismo que estamos aquí ahora mismo teniendo. Y la otra parte es algo que caracteriza mucho nuestras vidas contemporáneas, que es vivir en un mundo de elevada complejidad y no nos damos cuenta de todos los elementos y procesos que están funcionando para que nosotros podamos cumplir con acciones muy sencillas. Quiero decir, si en este momento ese micrófono deja de funcionar, pues vamos a descubrir que tendremos técnicos que están aquí por detrás y están posibilitando esa sesión que fluya. O entonces podremos descubrir que el problema uh, es un poco más adelante en la cadena y entonces descubriremos que hay dos personas que están haciendo las traducciones y las interpretaciones de esto. ¿Y todo para qué? Todo para que yo pueda hablar y John pueda escuchar comentarios sobre nuestros speakers. ¿no? Entonces, ¿qué quiere decir? Es que el mundo está diseñado para que actuemos de unas maneras que son, digamos, previsiblemente previsibles. Y yo creo que son estas invisibilidades que necesitamos comprender y necesitamos dominar. Cuando ahora tendrás, José, tendrás Puig, Olives Puig, José estaba haciendo su intervención que hizo es algo maravilloso que dentro de la filosofía pues Michel de Certeau ha llamado la, o ha evocado como la necesidad de los espacios de enunciación. ¿Qué significa enunciar dentro de los espacios? Significa en ciertos momentos subverter, subvertir aquello que está diseñado para que hagamos, para que podamos entonces encontrar alguna forma de emancipación. Entonces, aquí estamos buscando un cierto tipo de emancipación cosmológica, porque con la cantidad de instrumentos que tenemos nosotros hoy día para construir ese mundo y hacer con que nosotros mismos seamos ignorantes, completos ignorantes, de todo lo que está construyendo y constituyendo nuestras acciones y nuestros pensamientos, necesitamos luchar por el derecho al menos de enunciar, enunciar y emancipar. Entonces, uh, cuando John y yo hemos hablado hace algunos días sobre, claro, esa idea, porque si estamos hablando de uh, una historia universal, 
desde un punto de vista, uh, en fin, cosmopolita, claro, es lógico, los, uh, John, John acababa de decir sobre la filosofía de los indígenas, lógico, nos olvidamos que los puntos de vista tienen un punto, o sea, el punto de vista es la vista que se tiene desde un punto y el punto no es único, el punto pues es variado, entonces yo creo que hemos perdido, digamos, uh, ese principio de simetría, ya no diría ni de igualdad, es un principio de simetría que es mucho más fundamental que la igualdad, es un principio que más bien uh, no nos hará en el futuro luchar luchar por, uh, por ejemplo, en el caso de Canadá, es bonito, me parece muy bonito que Canadá, ¿cuántos ministros tenéis en Canadá? John, uh, en general, 22 creo, 20 quizás, yo sé que están divididos, 50% 50% entre hombres y mujeres, ojalá en el futuro uh, ese tipo de imposición no necesite existir y que podamos tener uh, un grupo ministerial formado por 11 mujeres y 9 hombres o que uh, ese tipo de imposición o de diseño pues más bien uh, pueda dejar de ser solamente retórico y que sea un resultado de una otra sociedad como es cosmopolita lógicamente desde el sentido uh, de género, desde el sentido de uh, razas, del, del sentido de edad Todas esas nociones, que son nociones, en fin, muy caras a la sociología, pues también empezarán a perder uh, un poco su valor. Yo no quiero, a ver, no quiero extenderme, tendría aquí muchísimas cosas que, que sobre, sobre tecnología, sobre lo que, en fin, lo, que, lo que dijo cada uno, pero, en fin, yo creo que tendremos la posibilidad de volver más adelante y, y seguir hablando sobre alguna cosa. You know, I think it's, I, I love the candle. And to be honest with you, one of the great things, and it's happening in many countries now, where there are indigenous peoples, is there's now no longer a public event in Canada that begins without a formal uh, introduction. It might be a smudging, which is a cleansing with smoke. It might be uh, uh, some sort of invocation. It might be a drumming, in which you thank the drum because it's a spiritual intervention. And what's fascinating, absolutely fascinating, is to watch 35 million people totally brought up on the rational European tradition sitting there through all of this and accepting it. Completely, you know, it, 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 theoretically in France it would cause a civil war, right? You know, is this, is this religion? What is this? And in fact, the people don't care because what they like about it is it's the reintroduction of a sort of formality of rhetoric and of process which indicates that there is a context in which a discussion can take place. And often it's matrilineal in its formation. It's not necessarily driven by men. It's a very interesting, and I often get up, I have to open afterwards, and I say, well, it's very interesting because none of you left, you know? And there was a declaration of multiple concepts of ownership of land, a rejection of the English-French concept of I own land, Uh, because I got it from you and you don't own the land anymore, and instead there's a, a discussion about the possibility of multiple ideas of ownership of land at the same time. A completely very interesting idea not coming out of the West, you know, fascinating approach. And the reason I'm harping on about this is because I think that we're desperate in the West to escape from the prison in which we've locked ourselves, and which is not functioning anymore, and we have to give ourselves uh, uh, new ways of dealing with this technology. And so, for example, Carlos mentioned M Marshall McLuhan, who, you know, invented the modern ideas of communication when the machines didn't exist. Now, in fact, Marshall McLuhan was the disciple of a man called Harold Innes, who was a terrible writer but a great philosopher, and Harold Innes, before he wrote his book, The Bias of Communication, wrote an enormous book on the fur trade. And that book uh, took years, and he traveled around, and he began suddenly to understand that the rational and the linear and the conscious was a very small part, and it did not actually replace the spherical and the agreements that came through the nonlinear. So it was, a, it was a revolutionary opening of another philosophical approach which rejected the Western idea and which actually led to understanding the modern means of communication which were being discussed earlier here. And, and actually, they make, this, this spatial idea of philosophy makes sense vis-a-vis -vis the modern means of communication, whereas the rational systems do not because they're too linear 
and they're too tied to a kind of practical argument. So anyway, it's uh, and and and, and I don't, anyway, I should let, pass it back to you. Well, and then we uh, basically have the chance to 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 to, to open to to, to the uh, debate. Uh, no, I completely agree, John. Pero déjame mantener el compromiso cosmopolita, ya que no tenemos ya que no tenemos todavía un, un idioma que debería de ser quizás desarrollado entre, digamos, todos los otros idiomas y buscar una especie de denominador común para que pudiera ser nuestra lengua, nuestra segunda lengua de todos. Uh, pero tenemos aquí estas, uh, esa forma de comunicarnos. No, yo he visto y creo que más o menos hemos terminado la última sesión con una cosa que me parece fundamental. Es como... Uh, la preocupación, y utilizo como ejemplo, ¿no? la preocupación con los fake news, ¿no? es, es, yo creo que era, era algo que estaba emergiendo, cómo están muy bien elaborados uh, los fake news. Debemos preocuparnos cómo están mal elaborados los lectores. Yo creo que esa es una cuestión uh, fundamental. Uh, en fin, en, en economía hay una, un principio fundamental que dice que la oferta genera la demanda y de ahí filosóficamente podemos también empezar a, a, a hablar de cómo uh, el consumo primero produce consumidores, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Y si estamos hablando de tecnología, yo creo que no deberíamos preocuparnos con que las máquinas empiecen a hacer las cosas que humanos podrían hacer. Lo que más me preocupa fundamentalmente en esa, en, esa, en esa discusión entre tecnologías que se incorporan, es cómo los humanos se transforman en máquinas, en su psicología o en sus uh, intereses. Y yo creo que si estamos diseñando una nueva cosmología, esa nueva cosmología, y ahí para estar en completo desacuerdo con Kant, necesitará integrar no solamente distintas culturas, pero la tecnología de manera prominente y el medio ambiente. Entonces yo creo que esa es, uh, en fin, es un comentario uh, muy rápido y creo que Sami querrá hacer el, el, el debate entre todos que, en fin, desearan comentar cosas. John. So now I'll, it'll sound like I'm reversing myself, but because of what you said, I think that there's, you know, we're not being honest with ourselves about how, or how we are, we're, we're not only not dealing with what this relationship with the machines is going to be, there's a panic going on about what is the relationship with the machines going to be, you know, which is an unnecessary panic in my view. There is a real panic about where, what people will do, and I thought the, the conversation about jobs just got started. We could have done the whole two days on the question of jobs and dignity and how, will, how should human beings fill their, fill their time, what will be their role if machines actually do do most of what we're after. But what, what, I, what, I, what I, I just want to say something, which you've heard me say before, but I, I think it's important to say it now. You know, there's a crisis in Europe. It's a particular crisis, which is described as a migration crisis. And I would just put it, I'll just say this to you, just to put it on the floor. For 75 years, Europe has been, Western Europe, has been a major land of immigration the rates of immigration to Western Europe have been as high as to Canada or the United States or Australia. And I mean, the Mexicans can look at this and we, would, we just look at this and we say, well, what? you're in total denial of what you've been doing for 75 years. You have been a major continent of immigration. And after 75 years, you say you're in a crisis. And why do you say you're in a crisis? Because after 75 years, in order to pretend that you're not a major continent of immigration, you still don't have any country in Europe, no country in Europe, has a minister of citizenship and immigration. The ministers are all junior ministers under the police, under the Minister of the Interior. You don't have a, a civil service specialized in immigration and citizenship, and you don't have, any country doesn't have a policy on immigration and citizenship. So if for 75 years you have heavy immigration and you refuse to have a minister, a ministry and a policy, Don't blame the people who are coming for the crisis. It's self-inflicted. And it's an infliction of unconsciousness, 
a refusal to be conscious about what you're actually doing. So I, the reason I tell this story is because it shows how deep the crisis, the intellectual crisis is. And then my last comment to that is, and, and this is where the Canadian comes back into play, is what we know after 150 years of a successful and unsuccessful immigration policy, it depends on the year, goes up and down, the success and the failure. What we know is the only way you can make that work is by being perfectly transparent and honest about what you're doing and having a very powerful ministry, as powerful as defense or police or uh, foreign affairs, a very large uh, specialist uh, civil service. And so that's the whole government structure. But then you have to have an equally large citizen-based volunteer structure, which is not about charity, it's about citizen engagement in order to help people who are coming find their way into the society. And that balance between honest and transparent government involvement, which should have come out of the Enlightenment philosophies, it should have. It shows the crisis that it hasn't. And on the other hand, this complete dedication of the population by the tens of thousands in volunteerism to help the newcomers find their place. You put those things together, the crisis disappears. Very short comments. Porque lo que, lo que dice, what, what, lo que dice, Lo que dice John es exactamente algo que se vincula con algo que Carlos ha presentado uh, y eso significa que es una determinada lógica muy importante ya no está funcionando. Carlos habló sobre, rápidamente sobre Ulrich Beck y la sociedad del riesgo. ¿Qué dice, qué dice Ulrich Beck? That's what you're for. Okay, exactly. So that's it. You know, the idea of Beck is that we, you know, after Chernobyl, uh, you know, we live in a global world and uh, we have uh, collateral effects. I'm sorry, the translated interpreters might be <laughs> crazy right now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so the, the, uh, the idea is that, I mean, it's not possible anymore to internalize the benefits of globalization and to externalize all the bad, undesirable side effects. And I mean, this principle, this condition is over, it's finished. We are trying to keep it, but it's over. Well, so, that so. That, that, but, but you know, that requires, I totally agree, but that requires a revolution in what we're teaching in the universities, a revolution in which, in the way in which we teach people from in the first 12 grades before university. I mean, it's a little bit talked about. I mean, what, the way we're organizing our schools is the way they were first put together in the late 19th century. Average life expectancy in the West in the year 1900 was 50. We set up the education methodology in the 1870s to 1900. The life expectancy doubles in a century and we're still using the same methodology, plus the machines, plus the medication, the medical, and we're still using the teaching methodologies of the 18th and 19th century. This is lunacy. This is called degeneracy. When you can't actually wake up in the morning and say, we won, we succeeded, let's do something else. You know? And that's where cosmopolitanism has to become a kind of revolution, not the Kantian kind. It has to be, and I think that's where countries like Mexico, with a whole idea of, of met metissage, where the Canadian idea, which uh, 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 Haroon talked about, of stop worrying about, you know, are they the same color? Is it all about the same language? What about our values? Well, I mean, it, it becomes very vague the moment one talks about the values. Something different is happening, and we have to have a different kind of conversation about how to do it. How to, and stop looking for, well, we can't be anti-Semitic anymore, so let's be, you know, anti-Muslim. You know, come on, and we have to really change the debate in a very serious way. Well, th this is a, a great conversation. 
why don't we open up and invite others to contribute to it? And, and, and no, I really mean that. This has been exactly what we were hoping to achieve, where we actually have a back and forth and conversation. So thanks to the panel here for doing this. We've got lots of hands. Ahmad uh, put his hand up or, or spoke to me first, so we'll, we'll uh, make sure we get after that to Marcelo and, of course, to Eduardo. Marcella, please go ahead and uh, once again, much. I'm going to try and keep us as close to time as possible, not because I'd like to cut people off, but we're getting close to times when people have told me they need to uh, travel and leave, so we do what we can um, and we'll have a final word from Mr. Comfort before we go. So let's, let's try and you're welcome to make comments as well as questions, but uh, please uh, try and be brief and to the point as you can. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I wish first of, of all just to thank the, all the panelists and the commentators for the great ideas they shared with us. Uh, my question is to uh, uh, Paula. Uh, uh, I, I've been working on a piece in which I'm trying to identify the universal values within Islamic culture and Islamic traditions. And in that piece, I had to put the criteria for what constitutes a universal. And I think in our discussion, it's very important to distinguish between the cosmopolitan and the universal, because in my view, the cosmopolitan refers to relationships, shared, shared agreement or uh, 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 civility in terms of our dealing, interaction with each other. That's what I think cosmopolitan is. However, the overarching values have to be universal in this case, in order to go beyond the cosmo, cosmopolitan to, to, to be shared among everyone else. So I put three criteria. One is that the value has to be self-evident. So tolerance, I put it first, and then I took it out. Because if you see the discussion, someone said tolerance is acceptance of disagreement. Respect for disagreement. Respect for the right for the other person to disagree. So there is no agreement on the definition itself, so it's not self-evident. The second thing is uh, it has to be, to, in order to be universal, it has to be irreducible and indivisible, like justice. When it's applied, it cannot be applied to a Muslim and not to a Jew, or to a Muslim and not to a Christian. It has to be irreducible and applicable, of course. Yes, the third one, it has to be the value, applicable in space and time to everyone in space and time. So I, didn't, I identified five or four, and my question is, and also to the other panelists, if they would like to comment, tell me if this pass, if these values pass the test. One is the dignity of the human being. Whether it's self-evidence, irreducible, applicable in space and time. The second is freedom slash freedom of choice. I'll just list them and then finish. The third is pluralism and diversity. That, that we are different, I mean, and we are many. The fourth is justice. Philosophers, of course, they will argue about what justice is, but I'm taking justice in the application of justice, the rendering of justice in terms of, uh, from the legal perspective. Five is cooperation between the human beings as a self-evident, irreducible, and applicable all time the value of cooperation, Ta'awun, cooperation. One I'm not sure about, compassion and mercy, the sixth one. So what do you think about this? And if any other panelists would like to comment on these, these kind of hypotheses or argument, because I still I'm not sure, I mean, whether this makes sense or not. Thank you. All right, who would like to uh, share some uh, feedback on that? Anyone before we uh, take some comments from someone else? Yeah, please go ahead, Alethea. A ver, eh, la cuestión de la universalidad es una cuestión compleja, evidentemente, pero no me parece um, una casualidad que justamente sea la compasión y la misericordia eh, los valores que plantean problema. ¿Mm? Um, yo creo que hay una, eh, una cierta un cierto consenso con respecto a los otros y una historia que tenemos, eh, una historia de reflexión sobre ellos. Creo que cumplen los criterios, indudablemente, pero la compasión y la misericordia en tanto tienen que ver con, la, con el plano de las emociones, entran entonces en un 
en, en un aspecto diferente, que es el de los dualismos jerarquizados, mmm, naturaleza-cultura, razón-emoción ¿sí? eh, y hombre-mujer. ¿sí? Entonces, yo lo que quería plantear eh, es que esos valores que fueron asignados a las mujeres han sido devaluados en el mismo estoicismo, por ejemplo. ¿no? Entonces, por lo menos nuestra tradición ¿no? filosófica ha considerado el valor de la justicia como un valor universalizable y superior, muy superior al de la compasión. ¿Mm? Bueno, en fin, no puedo extenderme sobre lo que, por ejemplo, autores como Kant consideraban, ¿no es cierto?, eh, al respecto, pero creo que si queremos eh, avanzar hacia un hombre nuevo, un ser humano nuevo, mm, sería necesario atender también a esos valores que son parte de lo humano y que han sido devaluados injustamente y serían muy necesarios en este momento que tenemos de crisis social, económica y ecológica. Eso era lo que yo quería plantear. Ok, I think we had a question from Marcelo and then uh, Eduardo, then we'll try to, ok, then we'll come to you, so please go ahead, Marcelo. Gracias. Muy breve, el, uh, a la idea de una civilización cosmopolita de Kant siguió las guerras napoleónicas, estados-nación, nacionalismo, que todavía no terminamos. O sea, el mundo fue por otro lado. Hoy en día, y me gustaría mucho conocer la opinión de, de ustedes, ¿hay algún elemento para ser optimista respecto a un futuro más cosmopolita, o lo que vamos a ver es lo contrario, es una explosión de nacionalismos, subrayar las diferencias y casi podríamos decir que hoy se ve muy lejano que podamos llegar a una visión cosmopolita en el mundo. No estoy hablando de la ciencia o la cultura, sino estoy hablando de la política. ¿Qué piensan ustedes? Thank you for that wake up call. Who'd like to, uh... Go ahead, sir, please. Por eso hablé del yin yang. Fundamentalmente, vemos los titulares de periódicos, las imágenes mediáticas, como ustedes ya saben, las buenas noticias no son noticias. Son, las noticias suelen ser malas porque son las únicas que interesan. Mirando fríamente estos 230 años que nos separan, de aquellos ensayos que escribió Emmanuel Kant, cielos, ha habido un progreso político, económico y cultural del copón. Otra cosa es que necesariamente, si nos dedicamos a la inteligencia, tenemos que seguir siendo críticos porque gracias a la crisis, eventualmente, a, perdón, a la crisis, a la crítica que se multiplica en el momento que hay crisis fuertes, eh, se consigue llegar a situaciones un poco más razonables. Yo soy optimista a largo plazo y por lo demás creo que no vamos a volver a conocer ninguna guerra mundial. 
tal y como las que vivimos en el siglo XX. Eso es un notable progreso. Ahí está funcionando. Lo que sucede es que el cosmopolitismo, como es fundamentalmente, son comportamientos, interacciones entre la gente, pasan discretamente de vista. Esto, esta reunión nuestra, es una prueba del cosmopolitismo. Pero eso es lo que le puedo decir de momento. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I know I promised Eduardo Bassisat, but you're a gentleman and won't mind if. Oh, oh I beg your pardon. Go ahead, then, sir. Uh, se podría decir también que el cosmopolitismo lo podríamos llamar metapolítica también. Algunos lo han llamado así. O sea, entender que hay un uh, más allá en las cuestiones humanas que ya no tiene que ver con la creación de un sistema filosófico, porque claro que contrastamos sistemas filosóficos o sistemas de valores y los discutimos y tal para ponernos de acuerdo, y esto ya lo hacemos muy bien, ¿no? y hemos usado muchísimo, uh, con muchísima uh, capacidad el pensamiento en Occidente montando todo este sistema global mundial, ¿no? pero se vuelve en contra, se vuelve en contra todos los medios de información, se vuelve en contra toda la tecnología, se vuelve en contra la riqueza, creando enormes desigualdades. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que falta aquí? Lo que falta es reconocer otro punto de vista, punto que lo podríamos llamar humano de entrada. ¿Y esto dónde? En el presente, porque si no se convierte en una ideología más. O sea que el cambio de conciencia es uh, un nuevo estilo en las relaciones. ¿Y esto cómo se hace? No se puede hacer con ingeniería social. No se puede hacer diseñando otro uh, diseño, que, que todos son muy preciosos y ojalá se puedan realizar estos salarios uh, um, mínimos generalizados y todas las formas de, de control, etc. ¿no? Pero esto uh, tiene que ser complementado hoy por un tipo de actitudes que solamente el ser humano solamente lo podemos realizar en el presente, porque es en el presente donde se ventila toda la cuestión humana. En realidad no hay nadie que haya estado nunca en el pasado. Y nunca nadie estará en el futuro. Entonces, es una cosa que tiene que ver con la humanidad misma. O sea, que o componer la propia carne, las propias emociones, todo en el asador. Porque allí es donde se encuentra el, la, la humanidad, o sea, el estado natural del hombre. Por ejemplo, la libertad, igualdad, fraternidad, esto la, el Estado lo ha, lo ha entendido de una manera externa, material, imperfecta. Y entonces la igualdad, la libertad y la fraternidad en el Estado moderno se han convertido en una especie de caricatura. Porque la, la libertad, libertad económica, pero ¿qué ha dado esta libertad económica? Pues el enriquecimiento de unos pobres y la explotación de los muchos. La igualdad, una frustración tremenda. O sea que aquí viene toda la izquierda, el pensamiento progresista de izquierdas a intentar igualar. Y, y es fantástico, no digo que no haya que hacerlo y tanto si sí hay que hacerlo. Pero, claro, es una frustración tremenda porque no se acaba de conseguir. ¿no? Y la fraternidad, la fraternidad se olvidó, se olvidó casi de entrada, la fraternidad, porque era incompatible con este egoísmo competitivo uh, sin fronteras. Entonces, este triángulo, libertad, igualdad, fraternidad, que no inventó la Revolución Francesa, porque esto lo recibieron de las tradiciones más antiguas de la masonería y de tradiciones precristianas. Esto está en San Gregorio Magno, Papa, allí yo lo, lo he estudiado. La, la igualdad, en realidad, es reconocerla, reconocer que ya existe, o sea, que somos iguales. Que el hecho de que uno sea mujer y el otro sea hombre, o que uno sea más rico o más pobre, o que uno tenga el color de una piel, etc., somos iguales. O sea, si uno reconoce la igualdad con el género humano, con los que son más ignorantes, con los que son más inteligentes, con los que son más poderosos, etc., todo lo demás va automático. O sea, que si reconocemos la igualdad, hay fraternidad. O sea, que si tus vecinos los reconoces como seres humanos que son iguales que tú en el mundo, 
Entonces, pues los ayudas de una manera espontánea. ¿Por qué? Porque las ganas de ayudar y la bondad son una cosa natural que va con, estos, uh, con estas tres etiquetas, que son igualdad, fraternidad y libertad. Y sobre la libertad hay una cosa muy interesante, porque podemos ser muy libres exteriormente, ir arriba y abajo, montar empresas, todo esto que ha hecho el liberalismo, ¿no? esta gran libertad de circulación y, y, de, y de acción, etc. En medio de todo esto uno puede ser un esclavo total, porque lo que nos hace esclavos a los seres humanos es nuestra propia mente y nuestra propia emoción. O sea que para ser libre uno tiene que afrontar su propio miedo, porque es en la relación con los demás, en la intercomunicación, donde aparece nuestra frustración, nuestro miedo, porque entonces nos sentimos separados. Y si el otro discrepa, pues esto lo vemos como un ataque. Y entonces nos sentimos impotentes y queremos reaccionar con agresividad. O sea, el, el sentirse separado genera la agresividad. Y esto es una visión ilusoria del ser humano, porque no estamos separados. Entonces, para ver esta unión con el prójimo, esto solo se puede hacer en el presente. O sea, ¿cómo? Comprometiéndose uno con el crecimiento personal, vamos a llamarlo así. O meditación, o... pero hoy día esto es muy fácil. No hace falta ponerse en meditaciones yógicas ni en entrar en ningún tipo de disciplina. Es una cosa que el cosmos nos está diciendo, nos lo pone todo a favor. Y las guerras y los conflictos y todo esto son ya tan exagerados que son casi una caricatura. Lo que está ocurriendo en Cataluña, por ejemplo, es increíble. En uno de los países más demócratas, más avanzados, más ricos, ¿no? más cultos, etcétera, etcétera, se está produciendo una cosa que parece un teatro de, de, de opereta, una cosa de, de, de una ópera bufa. Entonces, todo esto es un teatro que el cosmos nos lo da hoy para poder dar un salto de la conciencia comprometiéndose uno mismo con la conciencia propia y con la del otro y viendo que la humanidad todo lo universal no tiene forma lo universal no tiene forma y nuestra mente individual tiene forma porque tenemos una paleta emocional, tenemos una ideología tenemos un cuerpo y nunca va a coincidir nuestra individualidad, nuestra conciencia personal con la conciencia personal de los otros. Y esto vale para las personas y vale para los pueblos. O sea que entonces el, la transformación de la conciencia es darse cuenta de esta otra dimensión que no tiene forma, pero que es preciosa, que tiene que ver con, con una llama, con un fuego. Los griegos al ser humano lo llaman fotos, fotos o fotón, no luz. Y quien dice luz, pues quiere decir la proximidad, ¿no? fraternidad, afecto, libertad, igualdad, fraternidad. Ok, I know, uh, uh, Alicia wanted to uh, have a, uh, a comment on that point, and so did Heidi. So let's start with Alicia and then Heidi, then we'll come back and take some comments from here, if that's all right with everyone, ok? Sí, muy brevemente quería, quería coincidir con el profesor Carlos Moya, en la idea de que efectivamente ha habido un progreso, por lo menos en Occidente, hemos avanzado, estamos mejor desde la perspectiva de las mujeres, desde luego eso es clarísimo, pero el problema que tenemos es que los tiempos históricos son lentos, ¿no? es a largo plazo, efectivamente, y tenemos hoy un, algo nuevo que es el problema de la crisis ecológica, y eso es una espada de Damocles que tenemos y que en el, la segunda parte, según muchos estudios eh, científicos, en la segunda parte del siglo XXI mm, se producirá un colapso, ¿eh? o <risa> rápido o, o lento, pero en definitiva, un, algo que va a cortar esa, ese tiempo que necesitamos para seguir avanzando. Y eso lo tenemos que tener presente. Nada más. <risa> Eh, sí, yo quisiera reaccionar brevemente a la, a la pregunta sobre el optimismo. Yo soy optimista. Eh, eh, hay ya varias investigaciones que eh, indican que el ser humano, incluso a nivel fisiológico, viene eh, wired eh, para, la, para el vínculo a nivel de su sistema, su sistema nervioso, su cerebro, eh, ya tiene una predisposición necesaria de vínculo con el otro. ¿eh? A nivel uh, 
eh, filosóficos, si queremos. Pa cuando hablamos de vínculo, pues obviamente tenemos que hablar también de ruptura. Así que la ruptura y el vínculo son partes de ese proceso eh, que hace posible eso que se llama, digamos, lo social. Y cuando hablamos de tecnología, a mí me parece que en este foro eh, lo que ha más, digamos, dominado la discusión es una visión de la tecnología como máquina, cuando para mí la tecnología es un sistema eh, que permite precisamente vínculos. Y aquí se han presentado, por lo menos, eh, quiero mencionar tres proyectos que a mí me parecieron preciosos, el de Ivana, Oriti y Natasha, que... Eh, implica tecnología como vínculo, como construcción de unos espacios eh, que no es el típico, eh, la, la típica, digamos, amenaza, sino todo lo contrario, ¿verdad? Es la construcción de un, de un espacio para justamente establecer eh, algún tipo de desarrollo eh, de calidad de vida, ¿verdad? En ciertos, en, en ciertos ámbitos. Eh, y yo creo que es importante eh, que el aspecto afectivo que tradicionalmente se ha visto como dicotómico con respecto a lo racional, cuando uno estudia lo que son los procesos cognitivos eh, de los sujetos en tareas muy concretas, se puede demostrar claramente cómo lo afectivo y lo racional están íntimamente eh, implicados ¿eh? en el proceso de la persona actuar en el mundo. Eh, en contextos pues, eh, específicos. Así que yo quisiera llamar la atención sobre la importancia de investigar eh, desde el punto de vista psicosocial en contextos situados, eh, para poder dar cuenta de ese, de ese, de ese factor eh, que, que es importante, ¿verdad? porque estamos hablando aquí de la agencia de sujetos concretos, para poder como aterrizar en algo. All right, talking about bonding, how about we bond? Because I know we have at least three. Arlene wanted to uh, have an interjection. Eduardo Basisat has been waiting patiently. And uh, then we will also take uh, Eduardo Suplicy. Uh, could I ask you to begin, Arlene, uh, with your permission, Eduardo? And uh, if we could maybe try and make it a little bit brief, because we're actually getting into the overtime now, and we'll try and put them together and get some reaction from our panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sammy. Well, thank you uh, for all the, the input this, you know, we've been listening to here. Uh, I'm going to create a bit of confusion also because I'm going to speak in Portuñol, which is even worse, but I'll try. Uh, mi pregunta es si, mirando el título y todo, los que, todo lo que han dicho hasta ahora, el título de este, este panel que es Otra idea para una historia universal a partir de un punto de vista cosmopolita, si no sería más bien el caso de oponer las dos proposiciones, o sea, que el punto de vista cosmopolita no se concilia con una historia universal, porque hasta hoy todas las historias universales fueron profundamente etnocéntricas. El, el, el Mokadima de Ibn Haldun, los prolegómenos, la introducción a la historia del mundo, era la historia del mundo árabe. Esto en el siglo XIV. Uh, la historia del siglo XIX era una historia etnocéntrica europea. Entonces, no hay cómo, a mi, de mi punto de vista, poner esto junto. ¿no? Que, un punto de vista, que para tener un punto de vista cosmopol cosmopolita, uno tiene que admitir que no hay una historia universal, que no hay valores universales, que hay a lo mejor una, uh, una posibilidad de valores universalizantes. ¿No? que son humanos, quizá, pero yo no sé qué es un valor en comunidades indígenas de Asia que yo no conozco, que nunca fui, que no tengo, no conozco su historia, no conozco su modo de vida, no sé cuáles son esos. ¿no? Entonces, tal vez, tal vez, quizá, es incluso una trampa que yo me pongo, el respeto, el respeto sea la única idea universalizante que yo puedo concebir de mi punto de vista. El respeto tiene, de ver, con, tiene uh, uh, a lo mejor se expresa de diferentes maneras en diferentes partes del mundo, pero es una manera mínima de intentar estar abierto a oír 
uh, todas las ideas por donde se pasa y se anda. Eduardo Bastesat, por favor, go ahead, sir. Muy brevemente, la pregunta es para el decano José Olivés Puig, con su impactante presentación, traer aquí el fuego o la antorcha del saber, y afortunadamente sin pasar por los suplicios de Prometeo. <ríe> este, creo que en su exposición, profesor, se hizo un relevamiento del paradigma del antropocentrismo. Y me estoy preguntando si no es tiempo de un cambio de paradigma hacia un biocentrismo, donde es el ser humano en la naturaleza, y que esto va a ayudar a la conservación de aquello que sí es universal, este único planeta. ¿no? Eh, creo que hoy día la, el avance en la lucha ambientalista ha llevado a calificar a cierto obrar humano como crimen de lesa naturaleza. Es decir, es una destrucción tan grande, tan tremenda y tan irreversible que lleva a que la consideremos crimen, aunque personalmente no seamos uno o varios los afectados, sino todos. Entonces, que me parece que hablar de antropocentrismo es mantener un paradigma que ha perdido virtualidad. Y en esto rescato también el concepto de los pueblos originarios del continente americano, que llamamos americano, del bien vivir como el vivir en armonía con la naturaleza, tema que hoy ya figura en cláusulas constitucionales modernas como Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, y que es una manera de decir conservemos el planeta Tierra y conservemos nuestra convivencia con ese planeta, porque es lo que tenemos todos en común. Gracias. Shall we, if it, is it brief, sir? Then we can uh, yeah. pose. Okay, so a brief uh, comment, and then we'll, because I think a question has been posed to uh, Jose. Yeah? It, it's a comment, no? Hmm? Totalmente yeah, de acuerdo. Sure proposing. Okay, but we seem to be doing something else. Totalmente de acuerdo. Añadiendo simplemente que el, la naturaleza también es exterior e interior. O sea que el ecologismo, por ejemplo, es perfecto cuando entiende que la naturaleza la llevamos incorporada. Es decir, que nuestras emociones, nuestros sentimientos y las luces que podamos tener en nuestro corazón son también naturaleza y que por tanto hay que escucharla. Go ahead, so briefly, please. I would like to compliment John Rolston so for his analysis of the importance of Well, all of us to welcome immigrants everywhere. I would like to know if in Canada there is such a policy. I would like to tell you that uh, as sec municipal secretary of, of, some, of human rights and citizenship in Sao Paulo, one of the main coordinations is the policies towards migrants. And we had so many uh, initiatives to, uh, to tell them, well, uh, we are a city of 1,000 people from all over the world, so uh, we must welcome all of you that comes from Africa, Latin America, Haiti after the earthquake and the civil war, so many people came and <clears throat> from Syria because of the war there, so many people came and so we had many initiatives to well receive uh, immigrants from all over the world, all continents. And I would like to say a final word to Walda Kampfer and to Rafael Eder, saying that uh, in these three days I became a better person. Thank you very much. I have learned very much with all of you. I think there was, I think there was a question for you, uh, John, wasn't there? 
So why don't we uh, get a comment from you and then we'll have the final closing remarks from uh, Mr. Wadlah Khanfar. How about that? So uh, 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 we can talk later about uh, the, the Canadian system is completely imperfect, but it, it's interesting. We take about 1% of our population if each year in immigrants. So it's, uh, we're, we aim to take 350,000 a year, including refugees, and 86% become citizens within five years. And they, it, 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 it's not a question of how big the country is because most of them go to about five cities, so it's a very dense situation. Um, but it's not perfect, it, but, it, but it's a conscious, organized attempt at something, you know, which okay. therefore can be improved on. Yeah. Uh, so, but the, 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 I wanted to say that in the very interesting list uh, and, uh, that was put forward of possible values, etc., cetera, um, the word that was missing was empathy which if I were going to replace compassion uh, with something, I'd replace it with empathy. And I would attach that very much to what uh, Alicia, right? Yes. Yeah, was saying about women's values. I think, I think I don't, there just isn't enough that could be said about that, about the extent to which the structures we have are put together by men, and they really are designed to eliminate uh, women's values, women's approaches, and every, woman I know, I happen to be married to a fairly well-known feminist, every woman I know in public life has to go through a trial every single day because the entire structure of law, of government, of administration, it's all done according to models which suit men. That's why women are driven out of politics, because it's almost impossible for them. It's so horrible because of the way the structures work. I mean, right, right down to the fact that parliaments, most parliaments still sit you know, until 11 o'clock at night. That was so men could be there drinking and having fun and without the women there. And as soon as a woman has a child, she can't be there at 11 o'clock at night. It's as, it's as simple as that. And so there's an enormous revolution that has not yet taken place, which is holding back really this astonishing feminist revolution, which should be five times further along if the structures were not so male. And it is one of the biggest problems. I think one of the very biggest problems that we have, and I love your combination of ecofeminism. I think this is, this is like talking about what indigenous people are bringing, which is a different philosophy, a different approach, which is not coming out of the male view, the Western male view of how to do things. And then the, 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 the second last comment I would make is um, that uh, we were talking about, Marcelo was asking, are, are we optimistic? I belong to the uh, uh, optimistic pessimist group. Uh, and I'm, I must say, I'm having trouble with my optimism uh, these days. And, uh, and I would just, so that people don't underestimate the failure of the environmental movement. I mean, the COP process, the agreement in Paris. These are not victories. These are defeats. These are technocrats praising themselves for having made a 0.001% advance. So I have the privilege, and I'm sure some of you who've been in public life have had the privilege, but one of the privileges I've had of, is of flying in small airplanes over virtually every glacier in the Canadian part of the Arctic. So it's about half the glaciers in the Arctic. With photographs taken in 1945 to 50 and looking at the glaciers. And I can tell you that without exception, the glaciers 10 years ago when I did this, were half the size they were in 1945 to 1950. So when something that size is melting, we may well already be over the line. It may already be too late. Because if we're heading into an ice age, how do we survive? Even with the great machines, how do we survive except in Francis Bacon's, you know, Atlantis under the ground? So this is incredibly serious and the rational methodology has failed totally to deal with the reality of the crisis which we're facing. And, uh, and I think that is the greatest crisis. And then the final comment I was going to make, which, which brings it back to the subject of cosmopolitanism, I think we have to be very conscious that, that cosmopolitanism has to be about individuals. And that the great problem we have in the West is that no matter how much it's changed, we're still stuck in the Westphalian nation state 
that the models of leadership come out of the Westphalian nation state, which is a monolithic model, and Europe struggles with this, everybody struggles with this, and the, it's not only that, that it's the monolithic nature of the nation state, but it's the expectation that the individual within the nation state will somehow be monolithic in their loyalty, in their language, in their culture, and in their values. And this is incredibly destructive to what we're trying to do. And so the, the real cosmopolitanism today has to be the individuals within the nation state. And, we, it, and this goes back to the idea which were, uh, of, of, of that indigenous people uh, have within their philosophies that just the capacity of human beings not to be monolithic, but to have multiple personalities at the same time. And the, what, what I call a multiple personality order is probably the greatest challenge lying before all of us in the West. And in a sense, Islam, part of the Abrahamic tradition, nevertheless, Islam brings something very valuable, not completely different, but very valuable to that debate, very helpful to Europe and to the West, to the Christians and the Jews, very helpful because it is not so trapped inside the Westphalian monolithic model. And it is, therefore, I think, better perhaps able to help us find a way out of that towards the idea of a multiple personality order. Gracias. It's just, it's a, Can I just say thank you to uh, Wada for this? It's my second year. It's fabulous. This, I love this model. And thank you, Raphael. It's really great from all of us. All right. Well. Uh... There was an, uh, a nice comment which was made by Jose about the fire should not go out. It's still burning there. And the flame of common good is here now for, uh, for this CAF conference, Wadda Khanfar. So I think it's an appropriate time to pass the torch to the flame. Thank you. And uh, give us the final concluding Th remarks. Thank you very much to all of you. This was very inspiring two days of really great discussion. And to end with positive, I mean, of course, and optimistic note, what Imad was talking about is very important. And I think there is a huge debate taking place right now within the Islamic world about the issues of the contribution of Muslims and Islam within the, the, the global uh, civilization. The concept of having values that are universal, that are overarching, that the humanity could accept and agree upon is something, in my opinion, the way forward, not only for Muslims to be part of the uh, international uh, struggle for having a secure future, but also for all cultures and ethnicities across the world. And this might be the frontier that we have to fight for. It is value-centered paradigm that could unify us in order to find for the new generation and for our children and the grandchildren, safe ground to stand on regarding not only climate, but also even the very definition of our human uh, being and meaning and, and, and uh, purpose. The second point is regarding the cosmopolitanism. I'm actually optimistic, of course, sometimes in the morning I am pessimist, but in the evening, definitely every evening I'm very optimistic, especially because I see the trend. I see the trend. I believe that the current surge of nationalism is a kickback of the old regime rather than a continuous station that we may uh, continue to live in. And I think the future, which is much more networked and much more flat, is going to shatter a lot of myths regarding the concept of superiority of race or nation or religion. And this is why in the evening, most of the time, I'm very optimistic. While in the morning, of course, pessimist because you read the news. Once you read the news, you are pessimist. But once you think about it, you zoom out from the news, you feel a little bit much more optimistic. The third remark, and I would like to conclude with it, that this forum of common action, which we have established, I mean, three years ago with a great team, Rafael and his team, and the team of volunteers who, and interns who come together every year in order to support us, and I thank all of them for this marvelous uh, setup and great uh, uh, structure that they have started. In my opinion, this should, in the future, move towards creating a new agenda of discussion. You know, sometimes the agendas that most of us, and I personally am a product also 
of a philosophical doctrine and a social and cultural and political reality which loves to, you know, debate endlessly a lot of issues related to the future. But I find sometimes that most of my terminology, most of my perception is the 70s and the 80s and maybe 90s terminologies and perceptions. And when I interact with the young people, I find that their perception of the future is not exactly my perception of the future because of their interaction with reality, which is different than my reality. I find myself outdated. And maybe one of the things that we have to do, maybe in the future, very soon, next year maybe, is to include this kind of agenda which addresses the future through young, of course, this time we had marvelous young contributors, actually, I thank all of them, that they have brought great dynamics to this room, but this octagon next year will be alive with the great ideas, great experience, and also great hope that is profound and built on proper foundations, not only mere optimism, but actually new attempts to convert this magnificent thoughts and ideas around this table into programs and into something that we could walk out and tell the world about it. Thank you very much all and enjoy the rest of your evening and see you next year. Thanks a lot.